Now, if you will please turn to the book, Ephesians, the fifth chapter. Be you therefore followers of God as dear children, and walk in love as Christ also has loved us, and has given himself for us an offering and a sacrifice to God for a sweet-smelling savor. But fornication and all uncleanness or covetousness, let it not be once named among you as becometh saints. Neither filthiness, nor foolish talking, nor jesting, which are not convenient, but rather giving of thanks. For this you know, that no whoremonger, nor unclean person, nor covetous man who is an idolater has any inheritance in the kingdom of Christ and of God. So, therefore, when we turn to the Lord with repentance, you have heard in Brother John Plowman's testimony, how there came repentance upon him. Today, of course, church membership seems to take for granted the fact that they take for granted at least whatever may be the fact that here is a man who is a good Christian. And as John himself said, he was far from that. Now, think of that. The Lord Jesus Christ first taught, repent and believe the word. You know, it was on the law books of Rome that every Christian, Christianity was banned. And it was on the law books of Rome that every Christian should be killed. And some of the emperors enforced this, and some of the emperors did not. That was all the difference. But the cross was very, very real. I wonder how many church members we would have had if that were the modern law. And how many of you would be calling yourself by the matchless name of Jesus Christ either? But mark you, dear friends, so Christianity always carried with it a price tag. And today preachers appear to make it a, a, a smooth ride, nothing to worry about. It's a fine, smooth ride. I've not seen it that way. And to this day, I meet boys and girls at the university and elsewhere who suffer a great deal of persecution. In fact, their lives are threatened. But still, they have made their irrevocable choice to follow Jesus. 
So we cannot have a watered down Christianity which has no cross in it. So, my dear friends, we begin with a miscalculation. We don't take all the equation and say, hey, am I going to follow Jesus at this price? That's where the love of Jesus comes into play. When the love of Jesus constrains you, nothing appears to be a heavy price. Nothing. And subsequent to this begins the practical walk. The second verse says, walk in love as Christ also has loved us. Walk in love. I cannot measure the potential of such a walk. When you begin to walk in love and react with love and forgiveness, I do, I do believe that most of you say some prayer whilst there is a lot of difference between praying and saying your prayers. Yet, most of you, I would say, have some kind of praying which you do. Now, what is the condition that followed the Lord's Prayer? The immediate condition that followed the Lord's Prayer is, if you forgive not, your Heavenly Father will not hear you. The spirit of unforgiveness it rankles in the breast. It festers. It is a cancer. A spirit of unforgivingness. When you find that somebody has done something, they so offended you that you find it so hard to forgive. My dear friends, you know, when a cobra attaches itself to your legs and entwines your foot and begins to bite you repeatedly, as cobras are said to do, on provocation especially, well, you know, one way is to try to shake it off in the sense that you kick so hard. Well, of course, you're not kicking the creature, but it has wrapped itself around your foot and is trying to get a real bite or two or three of them in, and you sh kick your foot so vigorously, it goes flying. Now, if that's how you deal with a poisonous creature, I wonder how you deal with a poisonous thought. Something that keeps biting you, poisoning you poisoning your thinking. I wonder if you obey God's word and say, Lord, I just leave this matter in your hands. 
I'm sure I have been an offense to many people. Now here is somebody who has offended in this manner or at the, another. I will forgive. Uh, that's there an end. No more of that. You know, some people cannot forgive. There's not that forgiving spirit. I remember a young man who said to me last night, I nearly killed my wife, his young wife. I said, but why? Well, I was so furious when she confessed to me that when she was a girl, she had acted very improperly under duress from one of her own uncles. Well, you know, my dear friend, I asked this fellow, but how did you live in your youth? Ah, oh, he said, my, I lived a wicked life, my, that's true. All right, you're not ready to forgive your wife when under duress some guilt of, and sin came into her. And you want to be forgiven? Well, you know, different measures are used generally by society. A husband apparently can do whatever he likes. But if a woman does it, oh, it's terrible. Well, that may be the way society judges. But sin is sin. Here the Bible tells us, walk in love. And then it goes on to say, what this walk specifically would mean. Certain things were never to be found or mentioned. Even the occasion to mention them should not arise. Third verse. But fornication and all uncleanness or covetousness, let it not be once named among you as becometh saints. And now, my dear friends, one of my uh, children, one, the youngest of them, she said to me, Daddy, I know what these boys want. And she has learned also how to keep such fellows at bay. You know, some girls apparently don't know how to say no. Not only just girls, but very mature persons too. That's what I notice. It is amazing, but the Bible tells us that in the Christian walk, there are certain things which should not put up their heads. But fornication and all uncleanness or covetousness, let it not be once named among you as becometh saints. One of the wisest of men whom I have learned to respect said, Adultery is a sin against a nation. It is the breaking of vows. It is a sin against your family. 
It is a sin against society. And the family unit being the unit of society, it is a sin against a nation. And today, you know the way that people are going, the newspaper is so full of it. Uh, it's so trashy today. You, know, you don't have to go somewhere to buy a pornographic book. You know, the morning's newspaper has enough pornography in it. As a matter of fact, you see how it begets enormous problems. Children become nervous wrecks. Medical world is swamped with all kinds of cases. The classroom cannot function. One sin. And the Bible says, let it not be once named among you. And yet you have a nation that seems to think that this is just normal. And uh, we cannot be Victorian, we can't be Puritanical, we can't be this, that, or another. These queer Christians are a queer bunch. And of course, most Christian congregations are no example at all. No example at all. Anything seems to go, even in the pulpit. I was preaching in Sussex once, many years ago, and they said to me, here's a scandal over here. The vicar is carrying on with another woman, and his wife seems to know all about it, but she tolerates it to such a degree that this has become a shame. Well, this was 50 years ago, nearly 50 years ago, or a little short of that, 46. And you know how the things have developed lately, and what an escalation there has been in this kind of devious and immoral conduct shameful conduct about which nobody seems to be ashamed. And so much of it is covered up. And you know, fellows beginning to say, I was a chorister or something. And you know, the priest abused me. What a shame and a scandal. The Church of Jesus Christ becoming a place of impurity and immorality. And that is just becoming so accepted. Can't believe it. And that with the Bible before us. Let this not be once named among you as becometh saint. As a matter of fact, I wish I had a room full of priests, men of the cloth, and pastors and leaders, because if there is no cleansing, and if there is no deliverance for our, for our families and our young people from this code of immorality. There is very little hope. 
You see, you can't have a nation steeped in sin where nobody's word can be trusted. Then how do you function? You can function in the family, you can function anywhere. And the Bible also mentions, notice friends, covetousness, the last commandment. Why did the Lord put it as the last of the Ten Commandments? Thou shalt not covet your neighbor's wife. Thou shalt not covet your neighbor's property or animals or, or anything that belongeth to your neighbor. You know how today people are all out to follow the Joneses next door. Somebody has bought this, so I've got to buy this. This designer clothes, you know, I, do I have to do, wear at the back of my seat some odd name? and go parading it around? I don't know. <laughs> Do I have to pay 20 pounds more for buying that uh, wonderful vocation of carrying on the seat of my pants some amazing name? My dear people, how ridiculous can we get? You know, I always believed in having, a, you know, when I could afford it, my own tailor. And so I don't envy somebody who has got a well-tailored dress because we had our family tailor from my childhood. And he would come out with very well-stitched clothes. So that's what I was used to. But of course, today, I have little time for tailors and so on, whatever it is. Listen, covetousness, just keeping up with the Joneses or looking at somebody and and there it becomes a lifestyle. And you see how people are so into, being so into borrowing. I do not know if every one of you here is free from debts because the Bible says, Oh, no man anything, save to love one another. Oh, no man anything. It's a terrible thing, you see, when you have got to think all the time, money, 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 where am I going to find the money for this, money for that, and so on and so forth. We lose our sense of moral values altogether. It becomes money. Money dominated, money saturated, money ridden minds. And you become meaner and meaner. Money makes you meaner and meaner till you are looking out to see from whom can I grab this or whom can I get this. You know, folks, instead of the wonderful heart which Jesus gives, what shall I give? Let us pray. Please, Lord, to bring your light and salvation to the families. Oh, let them not fight against the truth. Let them not hurt themselves. Oh, my Father, let it not become like an old, old story which they've heard again and again 
and therefore they have seen nothing of it in practice. What a tragedy, what a tragedy. If we, are any member of our family should say anything like that, what a tragedy. Lord, we want those around us to have a living presentation of Jesus Christ. So hear our prayer in Jesus' almighty name. Amen. May I reach heaven.